Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we'll be discussing Book 4, Chapter 22 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Cameron and I know that this fantasy series is the best story ever written, and we're just coming at this from a purely fanboy point of view. Not really any literary critique. We're just going to enjoy this amazing, brutal, hateful, amazing series. Go I said amazing? Gorgeous. And let's face it, dude, this has lived up to everything, and it's just getting started as we get into this conclusion. Concluding chapters. <laughs> it's just getting started at his work, getting to this conclusion. Uh, the concluding chapter. Wow. I mean, it, he always ratchets it up, dude. It's like we're just. It's like the book is always on fire, anyhow. But it's just like all of a sudden, it's like I never understand how he does that. <laughs> yeah, I've mentioned this before. It kind of feels a lot like a Tom Clancy book, where you have all these different storylines converging. So so much happens at the end of the book. Yes, and you're like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> whoa. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. Quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and it's not recommended for children. Absolutely not. Yes. Today is especially bad. Yes. Yes, it is. I'm sorry, that was an uncomfortable laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, if... <laughs> <laughs> our show is listener supported i'm sorry that's become really uncomfortable it's like, it's like <laughs> we're not gonna go too far down the giggles today <laughs> okay sorry our show is listener supported if you'd like to support us we'd really appreciate <laughs> we'd really appreciate it you can do so by visiting our patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com currently we're posting ad-free episodes on patreon weekly also we would really like to hear from you so if you have any feedback or comments please send that to contact at horsefrogproductions.com Keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. <laughs> yeah, we got the other side of a tragedy sandwich today. So. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> All right, chapter 22, part two. We go to Aaron. Corbolo Dom's warriors celebrated their triumph through the night after the fall of Coltane. The sounds of that revelry drifted over Aaron's walls and brought a coldness to the air that had little to do with the physical reality of the sultry night. Within the city facing the north gates was a broad concourse, generally used as a caravan staging area. This open space was now packed with refugees. The task of billeting would have to await the more pressing needs of food, water, and medical attention. Commander Blistig had set his garrison to those efforts, and his soldiers worked tirelessly, displaying extraordinary compassion as if answering their own need to respond to the enemy's triumph beyond the walls. Coltane. His Wiccans and the Seventh had given their lives for those the guard now tended. Yet other tensions rode the air. The final sacrifice was unnecessary. We could have saved them, if not for the coward commanding us. For the 10,000 soldiers in Aaron, two powerful honors had clashed. The duty to save the lives of fellow soldiers and the discipline of the Malazan command structure. They now stood broken. Going back to us asking about the knives in the backs of inept commanders, Mm -hmm. If that was a bridge burner thing, do you think there was an upper limit on the rank where people would take things into their own hands? Was it at the squad level or would you see it at higher ranks? So, yeah. So you're asking that if it was just like, would we see officer upon higher officer violence? Like, yeah. Okay. I would like to hope not because the duty of an officer would be to try and get things done, but I'm sure there's probably some exceptions to that, but I would say but mostly squad level. But yeah, wow, pretty verbose start. Could have just said the squad level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bridge burners for sure probably took out some higher level. I don't know. So there's a couple of things at play here. Number one, back in that time period, the leadership was less infested with nobility and people that shouldn't have been in a command structure. Yes. Agreed. Dasim Ultor. Dasim Ultor. <laughs> and Kelonved implemented the merit-based structure. 
Yes. And that would make me think that there would be less of this backstabbing because a lot of the thought here was if someone is being an idiot and it's going to get us killed, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. So I do think that likely this was happening at the lower ranks. And back then there wasn't really the necessity to do it at the higher ranks. Now, in this scenario, I don't think anybody would have taken it into their hand. Like, I can't imagine Whiskey Jack just up and killing somebody like Hormqual. No. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I would like to think, yeah, I don't know, but there might be some things that happened around them that might make it happen that down the road could have pointed to Whiskey Jack, <laughs> but it would have been subtle. I don't really know, but knowing what's coming at this chapter, I can't say anything right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can talk about it later. Down in the concourse, Duiker wandered aimlessly through the crowds. Figures loomed before him every now and then, blurred faces murmuring meaningless words, offering information that they each believed, hoped, would soothe him. The Wiccan youths had claimed Nil and Nether and now protected them with a fierceness that none dared challenge. Countless refugees had been retrieved from the very edge of Hood's gates. Those few for whom the final flight, and perhaps the release of salvation itself, had proved too much for their broken, riven flesh, were fought for in unyielding desperation. Hood had to reach for those failing souls reach for, grasp, and drag them into oblivion, with the healers employing every skill they possessed to defeat the effort. Durker had found his own oblivion deep inside himself, and he had no desire to leave its numbing comfort. Within that place, pain could do naught but gnaw at the very edges, and those edges seemed to be growing ever more distant. Words occasionally seeped through, as various officers and soldiers delivered details of things they clearly felt Duerker should know. The caution in their voices was not necessary, for the information was absorbed, stripped of feeling. Duerker was beyond hurting. The Salanda, with its load of wounded soldiers, had not arrived. He learned from a Wiccan youth named Tumul. Adjunct Tavora's fleet was less than a week away. Corbolo Dom was likely to begin a siege, for Shaikh was on her way from Raraku, leading an army twice the size of the renegade Fist's own force. Malik Rel had led High Fist Pormqual back to the palace. A plan was now in the air, a plan to reap vengeance, and it was but hours away. I wonder what happened to the Salanda. They were sent off prior to the crossing at the River Vathar. Just drinking some wine, eating some cheese, catching some rays, you know. Sorry. A little Kelly's Heroes again. Sorry. Um, do you think that they were waiting to time this with Tavor's arrival? The Salanda? Yeah. I don't know how they would know whether she was going to be there anytime soon. They don't have a mage, I don't think. I would neither. Yeah, that's true. We lost a couple of men. Lost some good ones. <laughs> yeah. So that's curious. I wonder what happened to them. Yeah. That's a really good question. Unless it's just that slow of a slog. I mean... Th- no. They had the undead rowers. Right. Mostly dead. Mostly dead. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're not quite dead yet. <laughs> You know what's great is, and I think we've pointed this out time and time again, as we go through and we things we forget and things that we don't forget, but also the things that are revealed, the inner linking, you know, the ties together of the different books that are like, whoa, and the tying to events in certain books to certain books, and the timeline is always boggling to me. Yeah, you know, I love those reveals where you're like, oh, these are, I like how he'll, that happens a lot, you know, in, in his books. I love it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to when we get some expanded activities around the world and tying the timelines together. For example, what's happening in Memories of Ice, it's supposed to be happening more or less simultaneously to this. Yeah. So just making sure we know exactly where everything lines up. I do think that there is a little bit of a mismatch with some of it, but we'll figure it out when we get there. Yeah. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll burn that bridge after we cross it. Is that what he said? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, Billy Butcher. Uh, yeah. Blinking, Duerker tried to focus on the face before him, the face telling him this news in an urgent tone. But the first brush of recognition sent him reeling back in his mind. Too much pain was embedded in the memories that were so easily chained to that recognition. He stepped back. The figure reached out a strong hand that closed on Duerker's ragged shirt and pulled him closer once again. The bearded mouth was moving, shaping words, demanding angry words. Through to you, historian. It's the assumptions, don't you see? Our only reports have come from that nobleman, Nethpara. But we need a soldier's assessment. Do you understand? Damn you, it's almost dawn. Duerker asked, what? What are you talking about? Blistig's face twisted. He said, Malik Rel has got through to Pormqual. Hood knows how, but he has. 
we're going to strike Corbolo's army in less than an hour's time when they're still drunk, still exhausted. We're marching out, Duiker. Do you understand me? Duiker thought, cruel, so cruel. Blistig said, how many are out there? We need reliable estimates. Duiker said, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds. Blistig shouted, think, damn you. If we can knock these bastards out before Shaik arrives. Duiker shouted, I don't know, Blistig. That army grew with every hood cursed league. <sighs> Blistig said, Nethpar judges just under 10,000. What? Duiker said, that man's a fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Blistig <laughs> said, he's also laying the deaths of thousands of innocent refugees at Coltane's feet. Duiker said, w what? He staggered, and if not for Blistig's grip, would have fallen. Here we go. Mm. Starting to paint the picture. Yeah. Blistig said, don't you see? Without you, Duiker, that version of what happened out there will win the day. It's already spread through the ranks, and it's damn troubling. Certainty's crumbling. The desire for vengeance is weakening. It was enough. Duiker felt a jolt. Eyes widening, he straightened and asked, where is he? Nethpara, where? Blistig said, he's been in with Pormqual and Malik Rel for the past two bells. Duiker said, take me there. A succession of horns echoed behind them. The call for assembly. Durger's gaze swept past Blistig to the ranks contracting into formation. He stared skyward, saw the stars dimming in a lightning sky. Blistig growled, Fainer's tusk, it might be too late. Durger said, take me to Pormqual, to Malik Rel. Blistig said, follow me then. The refugees were stirring as garrison soldiers moved among them, beginning the task of clearing the concourse to allow room for the High Fist's army. Blistig pushed through the crowd, Durger a step behind him. Over his shoulder, Blistig said, Pormqual's ordered my garrison out with them. Rear guard. That's in defiance of my responsibility. My task is to defend this city, yet the High Fist has been conscripting from my own soldiers, bleeding the companies. I'm down to 300 now, barely enough to hold the walls, especially with all the Red Blades under arrest. Duker exclaimed, Under arrest? Why? Blistig said, Seven cities' blood. Pormqual doesn't trust them. Duker said, The fool! They're the most loyal soldiers of the Empire I've ever known. Blistig said, I agree, historian, but my opinion is worthless. Durker said, mine had better not be. Blistig paused, turning. He said, do you support the High Fist's decision to attack? Durker said, hood no. Blistig asked, why? Durker said, because we don't know how many are out there. Wiser to wait for Tavora. Wiser still to let Corbolo fling his warriors against these walls. Blistig nodded and said, we'd cut them to pieces. The question is, can you convince Pormqual of all you've just said? Durker said, you know him. I don't. Blistig grimaced and said, let's go. The standards of the High Fist's army flanked a knot of mounted figures near the mouth of the main avenue leading off from the concourse. Blistig led Durker directly for them. Durker saw Pormqual seated atop a magnificent war horse. The High Fist's armor was ornate more decorative than functional. The jeweled hilt of a Grecian broadsword jutted from one hip. The helm bore a gold-threaded sunburst on the polished iron skullcap. His face looked sickly and bloodless. Gris is a northern province of Quantali. This is the style of that sword he's wearing. Mm -hmm. It is also the name of a city on the northeastern coast. And Gris is known for the quality of the grapes in its vineyards. It is especially known for its full-bodied red wines. You'll hear people drinking wine from Gris yes. periodically throughout the books. That's where that's coming from. All right. So book your tours now, folks. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I was looking at the map of Quantali, and mm -hmm. Gris is really not geographically that far from the Wiccan Plains. Okay. And I was thinking about Pormqual's attitude towards Coltane, Maybe there was some raiding going on or some old bad blood between them in terms of Could why be. there was such a poor attitude toward the Wiccans. Dude, you need to put that in your questions. That's a big question. I don't think he's going to remember that. And okay. also, I mentioned two weeks ago how when I read this the first time, I had always looked at Pormqual as a villain. Like he had this negative attitude towards yes. Coltane and he wanted to punish him and then now that I'm looking at it he's just an inept bureaucrat yeah. and today I realized that it's been about 15 years since I read these books and I've changed a lot in those 15 years and learned a lot yeah and it made me think when I looked at it that way that was how I interpreted it as a younger man you know I was in my 20s I had just yeah. had my first kid 
And now I'm in my 40s and I've learned a lot more about the world. Yeah. So now I'm seeing things differently as I'm reading through these books. I'm seeing it a lot differently with certain things in particular. Mostly what we've been doing has helped me do is to see the, uh, what I've mentioned before, it's, it's the linkages, uh, which is very important to me, apparently. It's important in everything. I, re- I like seeing things, uh, how they piece together. And I just really enjoy how we go through it. But uh, I have my, a lot of my attitudes have changed, and I'll cover that a lot more in depth when we get down to the end of the chapter today, about especially about poor qual. And we covered it a little bit last chapter. I mean, I was pretty free in my thoughts of the fact, you know, I too had looked at him as a very, I always called him a piece of crap. And, mm-hmm. and I felt I, at points, at some points here, uh, there's points he's real. And coming up, he's haughty, and you want to hurt him. But at the point, you're like, I feel bad for him. <laughs> mm. But he gets to me both ways. I'm like, I kind of feel bad for him, but it really, really makes me angry. But not in a villainous way. Just it's in a complete ineptitude. And he's responsible through negligence to the Coltane and all that stuff. He could have assisted that at least. Good gravy. I mean, come on. Yeah. So. Yeah, we'll talk more about it when we get to the end of the chapter here. Don't want to jump too far ahead. But yeah, I think we're in alignment on this stuff. Yeah, very much so. Our thinking has indeed changed toward this man. Yeah. Malik Rell sat on a white horse beside the high fist, silk cloaked and weaponless, a sea blue cloth wrapped about his head. Various officers, both mounted and on foot, surrounded them. And among that group, Duarker saw Nethpara and Pulik Alar. A red mist descended on the scene as Duerker's stare fixed on the two noblemen. Increasing his pace, he pushed past Blistig, who snapped a hand out to drag Duerker back. (laughs) And he's going for it. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah. And I forgot that he was going to go for it. This about to whoop that old boy. He's about to beat the stuff. Blistig has saved him two times because he was going to go for Pormqual on the wall, I believe, when he wouldn't go after Coltane. And then Blistig saved him here again. Yes, I like this guy. I hope we get to see him more. Blistig said, leave that till later, man. You've got a more immediate responsibility to deal with first. Trembling, Duerker forced his rage back. He managed a nod. Blistig said, come on, the high fist has seen us. Pormqual's expression was cold as he looked down on Duerker. His voice was shrill as he said, historian, your arrival is timely. We have two tasks before us this day, both of which require your presence. Duerker cut in, high fist. Pormqual shouted, silence! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Interrupt me again, and I'll have your tongue cut out. He paused, settled, then resumed his statement. First of all, you shall yourself accompany us in the battle to come, to witness the proper means of dealing with that rabble. The selling of the lives of innocent refugees is not a bargain I shall make. There shall be no repetition of earlier tragedies, earlier crimes of treason. The fools out there have only now settled to sleep, and they shall pay for that stupidity, I assure you. Then, when the renegades have been slaughtered, we shall attend to other responsibilities, primarily your arrest and that of the warlocks known as Nil and Nether, the last remaining quote-unquote officers of Coltane's horrific command. And I assure you, the punishment following your conviction shall match the severity of your crimes. He gestured, and an aide led Duerker's mare forward. He said, alas, your beast is hardly fit for the company, but it shall suffice. Man, I'll tell you what, you better watch his mouth talking about that horse. (laughs) absolutely after all she's been through yeah she got yeah. Duerker here yeah. over that entire journey yeah good thing it wasn't the growl at gelding i think i would have bit something off dude yeah. Yeah. i would have just taken a chunk out of something um yeah. would, it would not have taken that insult very lightly i do yeah. not believe so but oh my word it's like this guy reminds me i'm gonna have to go south park do you remember the boy band episode mm-hmm, of course the guy in the mall that uses the hair gel to always wipe it across his head i am the one silence i am the one i forget what he says but it's like yeah i i am the guy i'm the boss i do you do what i say but it's it's whatever he says when he puts that stuff in his hair it's like that's who the i'm the music guy. producer was that yes what he... yes or something like that but he'd always say he made, he'd been say make some real fascist sounding comment like i have silence mm-hmm. <laughs> wipe it across that's what i'm a Imagining with porn qual here the way it's just too funny dude was that the boy band or was that the taco flavored kisses one with jennifer lopez oh my word that could be oh my i'm gonna i'll dig i'll have to dig yeah because I, I, I can't remember if there was a music producer on the boy band one but i definitely remember you're right it's gotta be <laughs> also in the mall though because they recorded her music videos yes in the mall. yes <laughs> oh my word 
I can't believe I remember that. It's been a long time since I watched that episode. Do you know why you remember stuff like that? It's because you laugh. If we if things make us laugh, it's been proven that we remember them. Mm, okay. So I've enjoyed that. John Cle- I would love to see this, but John Cleese, you know, Cleese from Monty Python yes. and Faulty Towers, he apparently makes industrial training films. And they're supposedly quite hilarious. And they're not just industrial, they're just training films in general. He's a film man. And they're supposedly just really hilarious, you know, and it's and apparently people learn a lot from them because they're quite funny. It sticks with you. I remember him playing Q and James Bond. He did a really good job. Between him and Rowan Atkinson, they're the best snide, mean-talking British guys that can say the meanest, harshest things without cussing that I've ever heard. <laughs> and the most insulting and the most cutting. It's like, oh, my gosh, how do you how do you even do that? It's just like, I'm in awe <laughs> of this ability to make people feel like that with just your words. It's like, wow. I, and it's not dirty either. It's like, wow. Uh, it's like, I'm impressed. Porm Qual continued. Commander Blistig, prepare your soldiers for marching. We wish our rear guard to be no more and no less than 300 paces behind us. I trust that is within your capabilities. If not, inform me now, and I shall happily place someone else in command of the garrison. Blistig said, aye, High Fist, the task is within my capabilities. His leadership style, man, very haughty. Yeah. I get where your questions of knives in the back for the high command comes from, though. <laughs> what I was thinking was this entire scenario we're going through today would have never happened in past days. Agreed. People will respect a commander that can be that haughty in some of these groups because they've earned it. <laughs> yeah, know? if it's like a Napoleon. Like, right, right. <laughs> you're kind of like, okay, we're going to win every battle, potentially. Uh, he has a track record of success. So, okay, maybe he earned a little bit of it, right? But this guy has right. nothing. Yeah. Yeah, this, I'm assuming this guy's, he earned it by getting off the boat is what it sounds like. You know, I don't know that we found out how he was appointed to this command. I can't remember if that's ever mentioned. Yeah, I just think it's alluded at through gardens that commissions have been purchased. Mm. Yeah, and, and the plundering is going on. <laughs> yeah, I would. that's kind of what my assumption is here is that maybe, uh, I, I can't say too much because yeah. I don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. We'll move along, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Duerker's gaze swung to Malik Rell, and the historian wondered at the satisfied flush in the priest's face, but only for a moment. He thought, ah, of course, past slights. Not a man to cross, are you, Rell? In case anyone forgot in the year since we covered that <laughs> chapter. <laughs> hey, this is real time coverage, folks. Did we explain that in the. Uh... <laughs> no. They've been, they've been about a year on the road. <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been with them about a year okay wow now i'm thinking about it <laughs> if it takes us 10 years to go through this book isn't that about the span of the goings on yeah i'm thinking oh so. boy wow we, okay. i think we i think it means we have to speed up <laughs> we, 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 we're not the books only get bigger you bring up a good point <laughs> i don't know how how do you shut me up <laughs> <laughs> So I was going to remind everybody that there was a meeting earlier in the book where Coltane, Culp, Bolt, Sormo, and Duerker met with Malik Rell. And Duerker took a stab at Malik Rell when he effectively insulted Pormqual for not welcoming Coltane to seven cities before Malik Rell began to communicate Pormqual's orders to Coltane. So he embarrassed Malik Rell. They were all diminishing his assertions that he was there to give the orders on behalf of Pormqual and they cut him <laughs> down a peg or two. Well, those guys, that was some hardcore company, man. Let's just take a moment to, you just listed off a bunch of my favorite characters who are now no longer with us. Yes. In silence, Duerker walked to his horse and climbed into the saddle. He laid a hand on the mare's thin, ungroomed neck, then gathered the reins. The lead companies of medium cavalry were assembled at the gate. Once out of the city, little time would be wasted as the horse warriors would immediately part in a sweeping maneuver intended to surround Corbolo's encampment, while the infantry poured out from the gate to assemble into solid phalanxes before marching on the enemy position. Blistig had departed the scene without a backward glance. Duerker stared at the distant gate, scanned the troops gathered there. Duerker heard, Historian. He turned his head, looked down at Nethpara. The nobleman was smiling as he said, you should have treated me with more respect. I suppose you see that now, although it's come too late for you. Nethpara did not notice Duerker slip his boot from the stirrup. 
Nethpara continued, For the insults you have committed upon my person, for the laying of hands on me, historian, you shall suffer. Duerker cut him off as he said, No doubt. And here's one last insult. He kicked out, the toe of his boot driving into Nethpara's flabby throat, then up. The trachea crumpled inward, head snapped back with a crunching, popping sound. Nethpara pitched backward, thumped heavily on the cobblestones. His eyes stared up, unseeing at the pale sky. Pulikalar shrieked. Dang, Duiker! Billy, I know the throat punch is one of your favorite (laughs) moves. Yes. How about the throat kick? Dude, if I could kick that high, that would be the first logical (laughs) move. I've just been settling for the punch in the throat. So, um... I'm also reminded of Tom Segura telling a joke about, uh, oh my good gracious, Steven Seagal being a sheriff in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, and it's talking about teaching people how to use martial arts. And he's like demonstrating to the other sheriffs, like kicking him. He says, and then you like put your foot on your throat like this. It's kind of like this. And it's for some reason that came to mind when you, the throat kick. I'm like, yes. Dude. Growing up, I was really into watching Steven Seagal movies because that's when he was at his peak. All those movies were coming out. Recently, I watched a documentary about this guy. Mm. He is the sleaziest. (laughs) Dude, he He is is crazy. He is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Go watch a documentary about this guy. Okay. The one I found was on YouTube. I recommend it to everybody. If you have any positive thoughts about Steven Seagal, he is kind of a (laughs) D-bag. Okay, I'm going to bring up a weird question about how one is cool and one is not. And it's almost similar. Do you know who Ginger Baker was? No. He was the drummer for Cream in the 60s. He was one of the greatest drummers of all time. He was one of these guys that had true independence for each limb. I mean, he could keep four separate rhythms like any good drummer really should be able to. But for him, it was quite natural. And dude, this guy, this is this documentary I think you ought to watch called Beware Mr. Baker. And he's been in retirement in South Africa. For, he just died recently. So when I saw this, he was still alive. But this documentary shows you talking to this guy. This guy's kind of funny, but you can tell he's crazy. He's got a guy that lived a hard, drugged out life, but still got a lot of money. And <laughs> living in some compound in South Africa, he got involved in playing with some bands that were political opponents of each other. And so he got in some trouble this way and that. It's very crazy. But later on, you see that this guy who's doing the interview and has, and has befriended him has got a bloody nose. And what's happened is when they've interviewed him, they've told him they're going to talk to these people. And they're like, he's like, heck, you are. And he pops him in the face with a cane. <laughs> <laughs> and Ginger is just that way. I mean, Ginger was apparently always that way. But it's like, for some reason, as a rock star, why do rock stars get away with it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Different rules for people that are higher up in the hierarchy, I guess. Yeah. But Steven Seagal is that, yeah, you're right. He has that special sleaze bag. He is a very tight, him and like, was it Ron Jeremy? They have that, they exude that same sleaze bag type. They're about the same level of pornographers in a way. It's just Steven Seagal is just selling other kind of dirt. (laughs) Well, I was more talking about his personal conduct in his life. Right. I mean, he did some bad stuff to people that cared about him. He's awful. (laughs) Go watch the documentary. It'll speak for itself. I don't need to talk too much about it. Okay. And then joking about the throat kicking aside, Duerger straight up murdered this dude. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I had forgotten he just straight up just murders this old boy, but it's just kind of like, you know, it just can't really get any worse. You might as well. Here's a shot, you know. He would have killed him at the Vathar crossing. That's true. All those people died because of him, because he's the one that was pushing to go across the river. I can't remember all the other transgressions that he had. He was involved in every aristocratic transgression involved in this book. Yes, the ringleader. Yes, yes. So we've all, I'm sorry, we've all wanted this character to, to not be here anymore. Mm. I mean, I, I, it's like, now I'm sorry that it's like, it, that was kind of cold blooded murder, but I, I, but it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> it will not be missed. Yeah. I, no moment it will of, not be missed. Yes. No definitely. moment of silence will be observed for this character. Right. Like for other characters. Soldiers closed in around Duerker, weapons out. Duerker said, by all means, I shall welcome an end to this. Parmqual was white with rage. He hissed, you shall not be so fortunate. <laughs> Duerker sneered at the man. You've already convicted me as an executioner. What's one more, you craven pile of dung? Wow. He shifted his gaze to Malik <laughs> Rutherford. And as for you, Gistel, come closer. My life's still incomplete. I love wow. that quote. 
I absolutely love that quote. I love how hard Duiker has become. And he is so, so angry and righteously so. I mean, good gracious. Everyone can see the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all see where this is going. This is not going to be pretty. <laughs> no, no. What was the other quote that was very similar? I think it was Tene Baralta talking to Mebra. He said, oh, come closer. Let me caress the other side of your face. Yes, <laughs> Back yes. in with that mailed gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. I love those guys, dude. They were some real bad dudes. You know, hard men that we'll never really get to know, I guess. <laughs> Tene Baralta, he's, he'll be around. Oh, is he around? Or yeah, it was the Satral brothers. Those are the ones that went oh. down. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. It's, it's it was so funny. It's like I it's I remind it's the Monty Python is about the Piranha Brothers. It's like it's like these guys are about as mean as the Piranha Brothers were too. Oh. Duerker did not notice, nor did anyone else, the arrival of a captain of Blistig's garrison. The man had been about to speak with Duerker to inform him of the safe delivery of a child to a grandfather. But at the word gistel, he stiffened. Then eyes widening, he took a step back. The gates opened just then and the troops of cavalry poured through. Motion rippled through the legions of infantry as weapons were readied. Keneb took another step back, that lone word echoing in his mind. He knew it from somewhere, but full awareness eluded him, even as alarms rang in his mind. A voice within was shouting that he needed to find Blistig. He did not yet know why, but it was imperative. But he had run out of time. Keneb stared out as the army surged toward the gate. The orders had been given, and the momentum was unstoppable. Keneb took another step back, his words to Duerker forgotten. He stumbled over Nethpara's body unnoticing, then spun about and ran. Sixty paces on, Keneb's mind was suddenly flooded with the memory of when he had last heard the word Gistel. And just as a reminder, this was during a conversation with Kalam prior to them parting ways. Kalam told Keneb that the bandits that he had temporarily rode with, these were bandits of the apocalypse, mm -hmm. they spoke of a gistel inside of Aaron as if it was a shaved knuckle in the hole. Not good. Really bad, okay? This is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Durker rode with the mounted officers out onto the plane. Corbolo Dom's army looked to be in full panicked flight, though Durker noted that they still held on to their weapons even as they fled back over the mound and its facing slope. The High Fist's cavalry rode hard to either side, quickly outpacing the foot soldiers as they pushed to complete the encirclement. Both wings rode beyond line of sight, into the evenly distributed hills of the burial ground. The High Fist's legions moved at double time, silent and determined. They had no hope of catching the fleeing army until the cavalry had completed the encirclement closing off all avenues of escape. Malik Rell shouted, As you predicted, High Fist, they are routed. Parmqual laughed and said, But they shall not escape, shall they? He pitched unevenly in his saddle. Duerker thought, God's below. The High Fist can't even ride. And this was the man who evacuated his prized stable on the same ship Minala hitched to ride on. You would think he'd have some experience riding them. I agree. But do you think, again, is that... Malik Rell looting the treasury and the horses and all that stuff. I don't think so. Some people okay. might be into horses just breeding them. Sure. Well, dude, I'll tell you what. I see horses around here in this country quite a bit where, where I live. And, dude, especially reading this book has just made me this horse love on every dead gum thing. And it's like, and I see those dudes, and they are some magnificent creatures, dude. They scare me, and rightfully so. And But they are magnificent animals, dude. Magnificent. I mean, it's just a magnificent animal. That's about all I can say. But I, I have had the pleasure of seeing a, as a young man, and I'm talking a real young man, probably like 12, 14, saw the, I think it was about 14, I saw the, uh, at the World's Fair in Knoxville, the Budweiser Clydesdales, and my, oh, my word, those are some, and I was already at my height then, I was, you know, I was 6'4 in that grade, I was already tall, and those things were still about as tall as me, <laughs> back's almost as tall as my head. <laughs> yeah, some beefy horses, Ooh. for sure. Magnif truly magnificent animals. <laughs> On the topic of horses, we've been watching that new Planet of the Apes trilogy. Oh, has that been good? Yeah, it's actually been pretty entertaining. The first one has Franco, right? Yes. Andy Serkis plays the chimp in all of them. The Caesar, right the main chimp. Yeah. But right. the reason I bring this up now, those chimps must have some crazy horse breeding program because they got some nice horses they do. in the second and third movies. Yeah. 
some really pretty black horses that they ride. Is the new movie a fourth movie or is it, it is. the third? Yeah, okay, Kingdom okay. of the Planet of the Apes, yeah. I've heard some good and I haven't heard real bad. I just heard some the bad was not you're not bad bad. It was just a pacing issue, I think. That's what I was told. Like but one of the things that I was told in particular was that the action in it Somebody said it was like the most immersive action they'd ever felt in some movies. And the fourth one that just came out? And this new one that's come okay. out. Okay. Yeah. They've been pretty crazy so far. Enjoyable. It's a decent action movie. I need to rewatch them because I think I've only seen the I've seen the one with Franco. And I've seen one or two of them. I just can't remember if I've seen, I can't remember which ones they were. The one I saw was where his daddy had, where it was Lithgow. Yeah. And had, and that, that's, that's the first that's, one. Okay. That yeah. may be the only one I've seen then. There's three of them? Holy moly. Okay. There I gotta, was I gotta, four I gotta, of them now. Right? So I've got some catching up to do. Right on. The pursuit took them up and over the first barrow, and they rode among the corpses of the Seventh and the Wiccans. Those looted bodies spread northward in a wide swath, mapping the route of Coltane's running battle over the next barrow, then around the base of the one beyond. Duerker struggled to keep from scanning those corpses, seeking familiar faces in their unfamiliar expressions of death. He stared forward, studying the fleeing renegades. Hornqual periodically slowed their pace to keep within the midst of the infantry. The wings of cavalry were somewhere ahead, and had not reappeared. In the meantime, the thousands of fleeing soldiers stayed ahead of the phalanxes, sweeping around the barrows, leaving booty behind as they went. Pormqual and his army doggedly pursued, down into a vast basin, packed with the routed enemy who began pouring up the gently sloping sides. Dust ringed the crest to the east and west, and directly ahead. Pormqual cried, The encirclement is complete! See the dust? Durker frowned at that dust. Faintly, he heard the sounds of battle. A moment later, those sounds began to diminish, while the rising dust thickened, deepened. The infantry marched down into the basin. Duerker thought, something's wrong. The fleeing soldiers had reached the crests now on all sides but the south, but instead of continuing their panicked pace, they slowed, readied their weapons, and turned about. The curtain of dust climbed higher behind those warriors. Then mounted figures appeared. Not Pormqual's cavalry, but tribal riders. A moment later, the ring of foot soldiers thickened as rank after rank joined them. Durker spun in his saddle. Seven cities' cavalry lined the south skylines, closing the back door. Durker thought, and so we ride into the simplest of traps, leaving Aaron defenseless. Pormqual reined in and shrieked, Malik, what is happening? What has happened? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this guy even has any tactical training i'm assuming not i almost get the impression that he's leaned so hard on malik that malik's like you know don't worry these malazans these boys are so disciplined and they know what's what all you got to do is ride at the front of them and just kind of hold on to your saddle and you'll be all right <laughs> gassed them up real good yeah minus the southern texas boy accent here <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that <laughs> You don't know That's what true. those people talk like. <laughs> That's true. He could be. He could be from the southern regions. <laughs> Malik's head was jerking in all directions, his jaw dropping. He hissed treachery and swung his white horse around, eyes fixing on Duerker. He said, this is your doing, historian, part of the bargain Nethpara hid to that. More, I see the sorcery around you now. You have been communicating with Corbolo Dom. Gods, we were fools. He's blaming Duerker. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Duerker ignored Malik, his eyes squinting as he studied the scene to the south and the tag end elements of Pornqual's army as they wheeled about to face the threat now behind them. Clearly, the High Fist's cavalry wings had been annihilated. Pornqual shouted, We are surrounded! They are in the tens of thousands! We shall be slaughtered! He jabbed a finger at Duerker and shouted, Kill him! Kill him now! Malik Rell shouted, Wait! He turned to Pornqual and said, Please, High Fist, leave that to me, I beg you. Be assured that I shall exact a worthy punishment, Pormqual said, as you say then. But what shall we do, Malik? Malik Rell pointed to the north and said, There, riders approach under a white flag. Let us see what Corbolo Dom proposes, High Fist. What have we to lose? Pormqual gibbered, I cannot speak with them. I cannot think. Malik, please. <laughs> Malik Rell said, Very well. He swung his mount around, jabbed spurred heels into the beast's flanks, and rode through the milling ranks of Pormqual's trapped army. It's crazy how Pormqual didn't even ride with him to listen to this parlay. Uh, yeah, he's such a coward. I need to do a care to come kick this guy in the throat. But um, <laughs> in all honesty, it's kind of one of these things like, 
you asked if he had any training. Everything about this guy screams that there's no way in any way that he's earned his way in any military way here. He knows nothing. He doesn't even know how to ride. And I'm assuming that's the most basic function anybody in a military function would know how to do. I know that foot soldiers may not know how to ride, but they would probably learn along the way at some point. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming he's never been a career military guy. Right. We know he's a bureaucrat, but I feel it's just totally bought and paid for almost. If he was an officer, then you would expect officers to know how to ride a horse because they have to be on horses to get around to command the guys. Yeah. There's, yeah, he's just so completely, I mean, and uh, not even that he's a coward, it's like he's just so unable to even process. It's like, you know, if he was truly any kind of officer, there would have been at least some taking the module that they make you take it work. You know, it's like, did you, did you look at the packet? Get the certification. Yeah, did you get the certification packet? You know, it's like, <laughs> did you even break the seal on that thing or anything? Come on. Yeah. It's like, you know, did least... you get a 75 on the test yeah, yeah, for leadership? It's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've I don't lowered the standards did. this year you oh, just have yeah. to you just have to put your name on the form <laughs> okay there we go <laughs> midway up the distant north slope the converging riders met the parlay lasted less than a minute then malik wheeled and rode back that's not suspicious <laughs> durker quietly said if we push back we can break the elements to the south a fighting withdrawal back to the city's gates. Pornqual shouted, not another word from you, traitor. <laughs> Malik Rell arrived, his expression filled with hope. He said, Corbolo Dom has had enough bloodshed, High Fist. Yesterday's slaughter has left him sickened. <laughs> Pornqual leaned forward and demanded, what does he propose then? Malik Rell said, our only hope, High Fist. You must command your army to lay down its arms, to pass them out to the edges, then withdraw into a compact mass in the center of this basin. They shall be prisoners of war, and therefore treated with mercy. As for you and me, we shall be made hostages. When Tavor arrives, arrangements will be made for our honorable return. High fist, we have no choice in the matter. Blood starts to boil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blood pressure increasing. Yes. Blood pressure increasing. A strange lassitude seeped into Duerker as he listened. He knew he could say nothing to sway the high fist. He slowly dismounted, reached under his mare, and unhitched the girth. Malik Rell demanded, What are you doing, traitor? Durker said, I'm freeing my horse. The enemy won't bother with her. Too worn out to be of any use. She'll head back to Aaron. It's the least I can do for her. He removed the saddle, dropped it to the ground to one side, then pulled the bit from the mare's mouth. Malik Rell stared for a moment longer, a slight frown on his face. Then he turned back to Pormqual and said, They await our reply. Duerker stepped close to his horse's head and laid a hand on the soft muzzle. He whispered, take care. Then he stepped back, gave the animal a slap on the rump. The mare sprang away, wheeled, then trotted southward as Duerker knew she would. That's another sad goodbye. Mm. That horse has been through so much. Glad he saw what's coming and set her loose. Yeah. Hey, question. Have all of our favorite the, the most storied horses survived not the you know we know not the wicked sacrificial horse that's a horrible thing but the other and we've lost a bunch in battle per se but you know the ones that have been with our favorites have all survived some hardships and been hurt but have survived haven't they duiker the grawl gelding didn't she survive i believe so i think kalam so yeah so the three ones that we have got to know and love dearly i think have all survived to some point they may not be they may not be in the story any longer but why do we care so much about the horses Is it because of the wiccans did Mr. Erickson get a horse? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. I, why the horse love? I Don't get me wrong. I've been enjoying it. It's the attitude that they bring in many cases. Yeah. Pormqual whispered, what choice? Unlike Coltane, I must consider my soldiers. Their lives are worth everything. What? Peace will return to this land sooner or later. Malik Rell said, thousands of husbands, wives, and fathers, and mothers will bless your name, High Fist. To fight now, to seek out that bitter, pointless end. Ah, they will curse your name for all eternity. Pormqual said, I cannot have that. He faced his officers and said, lay down arms, deliver the orders, all weapons to go to the edges and left there, the ranks to withdraw to the center of the basin. Duker stared at the four captains who listened in silence to the High Fist's commands. A long moment passed, then the officers saluted and rode off. Duerker turned away. <sighs> the disarmament took close to an hour. The Malazan soldiers yielding their weapons in silence. 
Those weapons were piled on the ground just beyond the phalanxes. Then the soldiers made their way inward, forming up in tight, restless ranks in the basin's center. Tribal horse warriors then rode down and collected the arms. Twenty minutes later, an army of 10,000 Malazans crowded the basin, weaponless, helpless. Corbolo Dom's vanguard detached from the forces on the north ridge and rode down toward Pormqual's position. Duker stared at the approaching group. He saw Camus Rello, a handful of war chiefs, two unarmed women who were in all likelihood mages, and Corbolo Dom himself, a squat half napin all hair shaved from his body, revealing scars and tangled webs. He was smiling as he reined in with his companions before the high fist, Malik Rell and the other officers. You know, I always pictured Corbolo Dom as a pretty big guy, maybe the height of Jason Momoa, mm-hmm. but them mentioning him being a squat individual, I guess he's not that tall. To me, Danny DeVito is squat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's more of a DeVito and not a Momoa. So, <laughs> Okay. Fair enough. That's, how, that's what I think of as squat. The penguin. <laughs> Toad like is squat to me. I mean, and that's it. And I, like Hebrick? Yes, because that's mentioned quite. Yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly where I was going. It's like Hebrick's always mentioned as squat and toad like. Mm-hmm. Kind of, you know? Right. Um, so that's kind of what I think. I, if squat is tied to that for me for sure. <laughs> okay. Corbolo Dom growled, well done, with his eyes on Malik Rell. The gistel dismounted, stepped forward, and bowed. He said, I deliver to you Hyphus Pormqual and his 10,000. More, I deliver to you the city Aaron in Shaikh's name. You know, I have to give him credit. He certainly is formidable being able to pull this off. Agreed. And you and I share a love of good villains. So I can respect the play here, if not the man. Because <laughs> it's pretty bold. It's well done and well done. I'm thinking of the villains that I really love. And I don't know what it is about Malik Rell that I despise him so. Oh, I do. But that's okay. I don't need a villain to be someone I love. I need someone to be villainous enough to earn the title of villain. Mm. Because so many times villains are so like, yeah, yeah, they're they're a villain by because they've been listed as a villain in the book. Or, you know, he's earned both the villainy part by being especially a wormy betraying type of thing that's villainous dude <laughs> it is i think the villains that i really like are ones that kind of exhilarate me yes, so i of think course. of obviously the joker in the dark knight or, get, or vader vader yeah <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> Absolutely. What about, well vader yeah. more horrifies me but what about thrawn thrawn as well yeah dude, Thrawn is what i respect None of these are slimy. Yeah, I respect them. I have a respect for Vader. I I respect out of fear. Thrawn, I respect because I kind of want to serve under the fella. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, because because he seems like a pretty. He, he respects his people, man. He's got his folks hard. He, he seems to be all right in that aspect. Now, granted, I haven't seen the new stuff that I think he's in with the Ahsoka Tano thing. He's okay in those. I haven't watched that. The supporting cast was not good enough. Was it the same as the Obi-Wan decision? Everything was just bland. I liked it for some of the information portrayed, but it was never very just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. (laughs) It was never amazing. No. (laughs) I think it took six episodes before he even showed up. Oh and my, no, 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 no. I didn't even want to see the other characters on the screen pretty much, you know. Okay, it's, okay. Let's not go into Star Wars because we're starting no. talking about the Acolyte. Yes. I don't even want to, I don't even want to <laughs> no, watch. No, we're it. not going to do it. All right. Is there any men in the Acolyte? Fourth, fourth down, fifth down? There are, but I cannot take this chapter and talking about that today. It is too <laughs> tragic for me to discuss these two topics simultaneously <laughs> we're gonna move along please okay i cannot take it okay i'm sorry i'm sorry all right <laughs> <laughs> all right how do you know this isn't my plan to make you feel better oh my god no because my blood pressure is already high <laughs> i'll have a stroke if i start talking about star wars right now i okay? heard your deep breath <laughs> Yes. I heard you breathe real heavy. You need to leave that in, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Duerker chuckled and said, wrong. And this is in relation to Malik Rell stating that he is delivering the city of Aaron to Shaik. Malik Rell faced him. Duerker continued, you've not delivered Aaron, Gistel. 
Malik Rell asked, what claims do you make now, old man? Duerker said, I'm surprised you didn't notice. Too busy gloating, I guess. Take a close look at the companies around you, especially those to the south. Malik's eyes narrowed as he scanned the gathered legions. Then he paled and exclaimed, Blistig! Duerker said, seems the commander and his garrison decided to stay behind after all. Granted, they're only two or three hundred, but we both know that that will be enough for the week or so until Tavora arrives. Aaron's walls are high, well impregnated these days with Odotarl, I believe, proof against any sorcery. Thinking on it, I would predict that there are red blades lining those walls now, as well as the garrison. You have failed in your betrayal, Gistel. Failed. Mm. At least there is a single bright spot in this section. Yes. Go ballistic. I mean, he managed to go Kenneb and ballistic. Yeah, they saved that city. Malik Rell jerked forward, the back of his hand cracking against Duerker's face. Duerker was spun around by the savage blow, and the rings on the man's hand raking through the flesh of one cheek burst the barely healed splits in his lips and chin. He fell hard to the ground and felt something shatter against his sternum. He pushed himself up, the blood streaming down his lacerated face. Looking down at the ground beneath him, he expected to see tiny fragments of broken glass, but there were none. The leather thong around his neck now had nothing on it at all. And that would be the vial that Coltane received from Quick Ben via the Trigal Trade Guild mission. Yeah. Hands pulled Duerker roughly to his feet and dragged him around to face Malik Rell once more. The priest was trembling. He said, your death shall be... Corbolo snapped, silence! He eyed Duerker and said, you are the historian who rode with Coltane. Duerker faced him and said, I am. Corbolo said, you are a soldier. Duerker said, as you say. Corbolo said, I do, and so you shall die with these soldiers, in a manner no different. Duerker asked, you mean to slaughter 10,000 unarmed men and women, Corbolo Dom? Corbolo said, I mean to cripple Tavora before she even sets foot on this continent. I mean to make her too furious to think. I mean to crack that facade so she dreams of vengeance day and night, poisoning her every decision. Duerker said, you always fashioned yourself as the Empire's harshest fist, didn't you, Corbolo Dom? as if cruelty's virtue. The pale, blue-skinned commander simply shrugged and said, Best join the others now, Duerker. A soldier of Coltane's army deserves that much. That blue skin would be from his Napin lineage. Lacine is Napin, and I find it interesting that he doesn't have some loyalty to her. Are the Napins known for their loyalty to the Napins? I don't know. <laughs> you know, a lot of I'm times sure. people have some type of the value of their heritage at least i'm just you know? giving you a hard time no no i know i'm just saying but yes you are correct there is sometimes loyalty between because we seek each other's out i mean it's what we do this is not unique <laughs> i think it's been mentioned before that the old guard were largely napping that's true i think the old guard it stated that they abandoned lacine so maybe uh, there isn't loyalty among the nappins after all maybe there's not. Okay. yeah Corbolo then turned to Malik and said, My mercy, however, does not extend to that one soldier whose arrow stole Coltane from our pleasure. Where is he, priest? Malik Rell said, He went missing, alas. Last seen an hour after the deed, Blistig had his soldiers search everywhere without success. Even if he has now found him, he is with the garrison, afraid to say. Corbolo scowled and said, There have been disappointments this day, Malik Rell. Formqual, still bearing an expression of disbelief, said, Corbolo Dom, sir, I do not understand. Corbolo's face twisted in disgust as he said, Clearly you do not. Gistel, have you any particular fate in mind for this fool? Malik Rell said, None. He is yours. That's cold-blooded right there. Mm -hmm. Corbolo said, I cannot grant him the dignified sacrifice I have in mind for his soldiers. That would leave too bitter a taste in my mouth, I'm afraid. Corbolo Dom hesitated, then sighed and made a slight gesture with one hand. A war chief's tulwar flashed behind Pormqual, lifted the man's head clean from his shoulders, and sent it spinning. The warhorse bolted in alarm and broke through the ring of soldiers. The beautiful beast galloped down among the unarmed soldiers, carrying its headless burden into their midst. The high fist's corpse, Duerker saw, rode in the saddle with a grace not matched in life, <laughs> weaving this way and that before hands reached up to slow the frightened horse and Pormqual's body slid to one side, falling into waiting arms. It may have been his imagination, but Duerker thought he could hear the harsh laughter of a god. Pormqual brought this on himself through his ineptitude. By abdicating all responsibility and decision-making to Malik Rell, he brought this on himself. That's my opinion. Agreed. 
this scene with the headless body riding on the horse, I'm reminded of the opening scene in Gladiator where the tribes send back the headless corpse of the Roman messenger. You remember oh, that? Nice. Yes. It's been a long time, but yes, I do remember that. The only other time I remember dead people on horses is a uh, fistful of dollars. <laughs> mm. Got tied in the saddle. <laughs> It's right at the beginning of the movie when they were waiting to see if they get a response from the tribes and then the that's horse right. comes running through. Yeah, I just had, I had that image in my mind. Oh, that's is, great. There was no shortage of spikes, yet it took a day and a half before the last screaming prisoner was nailed to the last crowded cedar lining Aaron Way. Where the heck did they get all these spikes from? Well, from Screaming Stand Specialized Sticky Spikes. Come on, Daddy, <laughs> Highway. I'm sorry. But uh, it's their nails. I'm assuming they're big nails, but I mean they, they don't take up that much space. <laughs> but they're needing at least six per. They're needing at they least. They had to have these for a long time. I'm... Yeah, well that's true. We're talking around sixty thousand to a hundred thousand. You know, let's not talk about the bent ones. So we need to replace those. So yeah, probably a hundred thousand spare spikes. That's a lot which, of stuff yeah, to carry around. Extremely stand specialized for sticky spikes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did you come up with that? Yes. Yeah, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be illiterate. Oh man. 10,000 dead and dying Malazans stared down on that wide, exquisitely engineered imperial road. Eyes unseeing or eyes uncomprehending. It made little difference. Mm. And what an image that is. 10 miles of perfectly planted cedars adorned with the bodies of 10,000 soldiers. Absolutely brutal and a core memory. Mm, absolute core memory. Yeah, really, uh, the methodical... <laughs> murder well it's not quite murdered yet because people don't necessarily die quick in this way yeah it's a really nasty thing dude yeah it makes me cringe thinking about it it's terrible there's just so much I, i'm not even sure what bothers me so much in this section i mean it is the death of first i was more upset by the death of colt and this group here i'm upset because they were led into betrayal but the betrayal is worse in ways in a different way that just make does it it doesn't upset me as much as it just makes me so stinking mad <laughs> it does it's so wasteful and the fact that they couldn't even defend themselves yes. it, it's just one thing after another first they have to witness coltane's death standing there unable to do anything about it because of the chain of command yes. then they think they're going to go out and get some revenge they're just like, hey, give your weapons to us. You'll be okay. Yeah. You know, and, and then they I... just have to accept it. It's like Duiker. You just accept your fate at some point, yeah. you know? I mean, and none of them really fought back because they kind of just accepted it morbidly. Yeah. It's aggravating. <laughs> it's infuriating. Their spirits were broken, I think, is ultimately yes. what ended up happening here. Yeah. Well, yeah, your betrayal of Coltane, then followed by this betrayal of the Gistel. Basically, there's two different things that are very similar. It's like they, they were already broken by this. Yeah, spirit broken because they come in here thinking, oh, we're going to catch these guys off guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to win. Oh, nope. <laughs> yeah. Not even close, man. Duker was the last. The rusty iron spikes driven through his wrists and upper arms to hold him in place high on the tree's blood-streaked bull. More spikes were hammered through his ankles and the muscles of his outer thighs. The pain was unlike anything Duker had ever known before. Yet even worse was the knowledge that that pain would accompany his entire final journey down into eventual unconsciousness. And with it, an added trauma, where the images burned into him. Almost 40 hours of being driven on foot up Aaron Way, watching each and every one of those 10,000 soldiers join to the mass crucifixion in a chain of suffering stretching over three leagues. Each link scores of men and women nailed to every tree, to every available space on those tall, broad trunks. To have to watch everyone go before him is yet another tortuous experience for him to have to live through. Dude, I'm going to ask a really bothersome and stupid question. Did they do it one at a time or was it done by groups and he just had to watch it? Or was it like, oh, my good gracious, he doesn't watch these last ones waiting for his turn. Either way, it's awful. I'm assuming they were doing multiple trees at a time, but yeah. still, it Jeez. takes time. Oh, my word. It's going to take good gracious. It's going to take a long time. Oh, God. Imagine waiting for your turn. Dude. Ugh. Yeah. It's terrible. It's tough. That's terrible. Durko was well beyond shock when his turn finally came. As the last soldier to close the human chain, he was dragged to that tree, up the scaffolding, pushed against the ridged bark, arms forced outward. Feeling the cold bite of the iron spikes pressed against his skin, and then, when the mallet swung, the explosion of pain that loosed his bowels, leaving him stained and writhing. The greatest pain arrived when the scaffolding dropped from under him and his full weight fell onto the pinning spikes. 
Until that moment, he had truly believed he had gone as far into agony as was humanly possible. He was wrong. After what seemed like an eternity, when the ceaseless shrieking of his sundered flesh had drowned out all else within him, a cool, calm clarity emerged, and thoughts scattered and wandering rose into his fading awareness. He thought, the Jagut ghost, why do I think of him now, of that eternity of grief? What is he to me? What is anyone or anything to me now? I await Hood's gate at last. The time for memories, for regrets and comprehensions is past. You must see that now, old man. Your nameless marine awaits you, and Bolt and Corporal List, and Lull, and Solmar and Mincer, Culp and Hebrick too, most likely. You leave a place of strangers now, and go to a place of companions, of friends. So claim the priests of Hood. It's the last gift. I am done with this world, for I am alone in it. Alone. A ghostly, tusked face rose before his mind's eye, and though he had never before seen it, he knew that the Jagut had found him. The gravest compassion filled that creature's unhuman eyes, a compassion that Duiker could not understand. He thought, Why grieve, Jagut? I shall not haunt eternity as you have done. I shall not return to this place, nor suffer again the losses a mortal suffers in life and in living. Hood is about to bless me, Jagut. No need to grieve. Those thoughts echoed only a moment longer as the Jagut's ravaged face faded and darkness closed in around Duerker, closed in until it swallowed him, and with it, awareness ceased. And thus the chapter ends. Mm. Ugh. Grueling. I just realized that we never found out what that nameless Marine wrote on that note. Do you remember if we find that out later? I'm not sure. Yeah. For standout moments, <laughs> I mean, this is a tough section, but... Uh, yeah, it is. Nethpara getting his due. Agreed. That throat kick. Yeah, pretty righteous. I enjoyed that. Very I don't know if I enjoyed it, but you know, I did. it, it I'm felt say, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to say I enjoyed it. We do not enjoy the death of others. <laughs> You're correct. I'm not supposed to, especially as a Christian man, I'm not supposed to be that way, but this man's fictional. I mean, mm. he's, earned, he's earned it, dude. Well, he certainly earned it. I don't know about How reveling. He, 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 I'm not reveling it. It's yeah. just the guy's responsible for thousands of people getting killed probably yes and, and so he should have died a long time ago <laughs> but that i think that was saved so we at least get so at least do it we get his two cents worth at least so that's why they uh, this is why it's so satisfying it's because at least it's like you know what here you go <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i got nothing else I yeah. got, I got, it's, it's all going downhill at least i'm gonna take you with me true Keneb remembering where he heard Gistel previously. That was a nice setup that Mr. Erickson did there earlier in the book. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And really kind of chilling as he puts two and two together there. Mm-hmm. Too bad it wasn't sooner. Yes. Well, he didn't. He never heard it. Yeah. It yeah. was just, that's what makes it so much more tragic. But you're right. I think it makes it tragic, but it's also, I think you're right. It's what enabled him and Blisting to get that place sealed back up. Yes. Pornqual's absolute incompetence as a commander fully on display. Very irritating, to put it mildly. <laughs> Vastly understating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Duerker's goodbye to his horse. Yeah. He's very uh, horse. heartfelt. Great horse, man. That horse has been with us the longest of any horse in the book. Yes. Because the other ones were let loose at the different points, I believe. Here, this one's gone with us since he hit the ground. Malik Rell's betrayal of the Malazan forces. Oh, man, despicable yet bold, but despicable. He was playing 4D chess this whole time. Yep. Pornqual getting beheaded and his horse riding off. Now that is a strong image. It's not quite a core memory, but it has always, that's, that's stuck with me because I've not liked Pornqual, but I have a, you know, oh, I'll cover this in just a second, but go ahead. <laughs> and then the absolutely brutal end to High Fist Pornqual's army. For those soldiers to not even have the ability to defend themselves. What a maddening end to the chapter. And it still enrages me every time yes. I read it. It does. It, but it's the, the, in this time, as we've covered a little bit already, I'm not so in, you know, I think this is wrongfully colored porn qual. Yeah, he's despicable and, and not a good guy, but he's more of a, just a useful idiot for Malik Rell to turn and use in this betrayal. That is a perfect description. He is a useful idiot. Yeah. And it's like, so I'm more angry and I should be more angry at Malik Rell and I am, but I'm always, it's, it's porn call that sticks with me. Well, Malik Rell, even at the beginning of this book, 
my distaste for him was clearly evident. <laughs> yes. But he, it is, but we don't see him that much. We still don't see him as much as we've seen Porn Qual talked about. True. True. Through this book. And so all this talking about, you know, it's it grows and it makes you it's easy to join in the anger, hatred of people as we talk talking trash, as we get as we get closer to you. Like, Man, that's yeah. And then when you get to it, you're like, oh, okay. I don't really remember it that way, but now I guess I'll try to remember it that way. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, to cap out that tragedy, Duerker getting crucified, the yeah. description of it is really horrific. Oh, yeah. And yeah, just, it's really upsetting. Are you aware that the term excruciating does come, in fact, from the word crucifixion? No. It does. It, mm. it comes from that word. And yeah, that's a really horrific image of like how bad it was. And then having the scaffolding taken out from under you, then that's like, wow, I thought that was bad before. <laughs> yeah. It's like now it's really bad. It's like wow, can't it's awful imagine. Static. Oh no, yeah, awful. All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, good, good job, man. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Just great episode. Can't wait to see where it's all building up to. You know, the thing that's so fantastic always about his books is that he has some of the most action-packed books, and yet he still manages to go up a notch or two at the end of the books it's like he jumps up till he may go to 12 for all i know I and mean, he's may skip 12 11 all together <laughs> and go to 12. <laughs> oh he definitely has some extra spots on the dial yeah i'm always amazed by that how it just keeps getting up and up and up here man wow i love it yeah all right thanks everybody we'll see you next week see y'all next week we thank you all for joining us today Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.